Hello everyone. So, I have a little confession to make. Um, I had an idea for a video while looking at Stefan Molyneux's The Truth About X series, in particular his videos about popular contemporary movies. Now, my idea was to watch all of those videos and make a sort of rapid-fire, reverse, CinemaSins-style debunking video where I point out all the time Stefan screwed up, or misremembered something, or misrepresented what was in the movie, and so on. Uh, so I sat down with my notebook and put the first one on, uh, the truth about Wonder Woman. Now, as I watched this video, I very quickly realised that my original idea was not going to pan out. You see, Stefan gets so many things wrong about just this one particular movie that any response seeking to address all of his movie videos would probably be several hours long, uh, so I had to abandon my original plan and just concern myself with the truth about Wonder Woman today. I'm very sorry. And now the reason I started out by watching that video is because I was honestly looking forward to Stefan's take on the Wonder Woman movie. And that's because back in April, uh, Stefan posted this tweet. Pasta in tomato sauce, now with feminist virtue signalling. Um, and there's a photograph of a can of pasta in tomato sauce with some female superheroes on it. Uh, Wonder Woman included. And I like this tweet a lot uh, for a few reasons, and let me briefly run them by you. Firstly, I like the idea that a can of pasta is apparently feminist because it has a picture of a cartoon lady on it. Uh, likewise, this is apparently virtue signalling, although as to what virtues are being signalled here, who knows? The can just has a picture of Supergirl on it, that's it. Unless no artificial flavours or preservatives is virtue signalling now. I'm at a loss there. Uh, the next thing I like about this tweet is that Stefan appears to have purchased the can of pasta and tomato sauce in order to complain about it, uh, which would be funny enough by itself, to be honest, but as people were quick to point out to Stefan, uh, the cans also had versions with male superheroes on, such as Superman and Batman. Um, apparently the existence of male superheroes on cans of pasta doesn't qualify as virtue signalling for whatever reason. This is Molyneux's projecting problem that I've spoken about in a previous video. Any depiction of a woman, even a completely neutrally presented cartoon of a fictional woman in a meaningless context, on a can of pasta even, is apparently malicious feminist virtue signalling now, as if the mere fact that Supergirl or Wonder Woman exist at all is somehow a problem. So anyway, after seeing Stefan's take on a can of pasta with Wonder Woman on it, how could I not be excited for his video review of the Wonder Woman movie that came out this year? Um, we know how much Stefan likes seeing women fight against men in movies, and this movie has the all-female warrior race, the Amazons, in it, so you know we're in for a good time. So let's get to it, and we're going to go about this semi-chronologically here. We'll work through Stefan's video from start to finish with some skipping around as needed, um, and it should go without saying here, there will be spoilers from this point on, so beware. And let's begin. So the artistry, charm and special effects, and one powerful twist are the only things that rescue Wonder Woman from its own stultifying cliches. First of all, I give you the cliches. One. A female-run society is a paradise. Now, there's a very good reason for this. You see, the island the Amazons live on is a paradise. A literal god-given paradise. With his dying breath, Zeus created this island to hide us from the outside world. Somewhere Ares could not find us. We give thanks to the gods for giving us this paradise. It's not a paradise because women live on it, it's a paradise because Zeus, a male god by the way, it created it to be that way. During the first scenes on the island of, well, let's just say it somewhat reminds me of the Greek island of Lesbos, the skies are blue, the waterfalls seem to spill diamonds, and no woman seems to age much past 45. Ha ha, the Amazons are gay. <sighs> Anyway, uh, this is the first point in the video that Stefan is confused about the fact that the Amazons don't age, and he further expands on that point. Now, of course, there are no old women on this island, because that would beg the question, where are all these women coming from? 
Is there a gimp in a leather suit in a box used for sperm harvesting? A male baby's killed off? So where are the old Amazons? And without men, how are the Amazons being born? Well, near the start of the movie, Diana's mother, the queen of the Amazons, explains all this to Diana as a child. The Amazons were created by Zeus, and we see them emerging from the sea as fully grown women. And Diana's mother in this flashback appears to be the exact same age as she is when she's reading the story. So the Amazons aren't born, they were created by a god, and they don't appear to age. Which explains both why there aren't any old Amazons, and why they don't need any men on the island. And if the literal picture book explained to a child method of exposition was a bit too complicated for Stefan, there are other clues cleverly hidden in the narrative. Uh, for example, Diana ages from a child to a fully grown woman without any other character on the island aging a day. Isn't that odd? Now, Diana ages, I presume, because she's not an Amazon, exactly. She was created differently from the rest of them as a child. Uh, but even she ages very slowly. And the big tip-off here is that the movie opens in the present day, but the bulk of it is a flashback set in the First World War, and Wonder Woman looks exactly the same in both times. Didn't Stefan wonder why this was? Did he not notice that that was unusual? I don't know. And these Amazons take the only man on the island and interrogate him. When logically, of course, they should be burying him in affirmative action programs. Now this is a minor point here, but the Amazons interrogate him because he's dressed in the same uniform as the soldiers who attacked them. Because he's a spy. You... No. no, mother, no. He fought at my side against the invaders. man fights against his own people. These aren't my people. And why do you wear their colors? I can't tell you that. So they interrogate him to find out why that is. You know, they're not just doing it arbitrarily, but like I say, that's a minor point. Cliché number two. Women are great warriors. Now, I've criticized female fighters in movies before for taking on men three times their size with little or no prior training. In this movie, Wonder Woman, whose actual name is Diana, does go through years of rigorous training but gains supernatural powers somehow when she hits her late teens. She magically throws back her trainer half the length of a football field by blocking a sword blow with her golden bracers. This new power has two primary meanings. The first is the pushback of, a, of an abused child who has grown bigger and stronger than her aging abuser. The second is the displacement of an older woman's physical attractiveness by a younger woman. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, first off, Wonder Woman's size doesn't matter. She's a demigod with supernatural powers. She can hold a tank over her head. You know, the amount of training she does is, with regards to fighting against human men, anyway, completely inconsequential. She's training to fight against Ares, the god of war. She could crush a human man's head like a grape even if she hadn't trained a day in her life because she's not human. Uh, secondly, Stefan's two primary readings of the meaning of this scene are very telling. Uh, the pushback of an abused child, and the displacement of an older woman's physical attractiveness by a younger woman. Now, okay, I'm generally rather accepting of unconventional takes on movies. I mean, I have to be. I'm pals with the prequel Defender himself. Uh, but I can't help but think Stefan is reaching a little too far here. Diana and her aunt appear to have a good relationship, so I'm not sure the abuser angle flies, really. Uh, to me, this scene is just showing that Diana has some unexplained power that differentiates her from the rest of the Amazons. That seems to be the primary meaning of the scene, and as we'll see later in the video, it's a meaning that Stefan missed somehow, uh, but we'll get back to that later. Cliché number three. The hot Amazon supermodel librarian. A beautiful woman who has no idea how attractive she is. The dream of beta males everywhere who've never listened to Stanley Kowalski from A Streetcar Named Desire who says this to an erotic woman fishing for compliments. I never met a dame yet that didn't know if she was good looking or not without being told. And there's some of them that give themselves credit for more than they've got. Trust me, the lead actress may be playing a naive otherworldly warrior, but in real life, she knows exactly how attractive she is. 
She was a model who married a man who sold a hotel for $26 million. Here's a hint. You're not going to take off her thick glasses, tell her she's beautiful, and have her fall in love with you. So for cliche number three, I have three points to make. Isn't that nice? Um, the first is that Diana isn't human and has never interacted with human society and therefore doesn't have the same ideas about what is appropriate behaviour or is attractive to the opposite sex. She's never even met a man before the events of the movie. Have you never met a man before? But what about your father? I had no father. Secondly, it doesn't matter who the actor is, she's playing a character. We know she's rich and famous in real life, but that isn't supposed to affect the narrative of the film. You know, does Stefan do this for other movies? Henry Cavill can't fly. He's just a regular human actor. This film doesn't make any sense. Thirdly, the idea that Diana is still very attractive, even if you cover her up and put glasses on her, is actually stated outright in the film. Yeah, really specs. Suddenly she's not the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. The film's point here, one that it makes a few too many times for me to be honest, is that yes, Diana is very attractive. Anyway. Cliché number four, the incomprehensibly jealous and angry villain. Now, the intergalactic badass in Wonder Woman is the god Ares, who becomes jealous of Zeus's favourite created toy, humanity. So this is basic sibling rivalry cliche 101. The elder sibling resents the younger sibling for the attention paid by the parents to the new arrival who has displaced him. I have two points to make here, and the first one is kind of a minor nitpicky one. Um, Ares isn't an intergalactic villain. He doesn't travel to or from another galaxy at any point. And now I only bring this up because Stefan has previously misunderstood the word intergalactic. Now I think he thinks it means like phenomenal or grand or something. Anyway, uh, secondly here, Stefan says Ares, the god of war, being angry, is a cliche. And if Stefan has a problem with the conflict between Zeus and Ares, or Ares being violent and angry, or even the Amazonian warrior women, he really needs to take that up with the ancient Greeks. You know, this narrative isn't the result of some modern, malicious Hollywood machination. They're characters from Greek mythology. And I thought Stefan was all about the ancient Greeks and Western civilization and everything. But I guess I must have been mistaken there. Diana, princess of blow-dried hair, shopping and not eating. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Wrong, Princess Diana. Diana, princess of Themyscira, possesses powers that make no sense at all. So Ares, the god of war, kills her father Zeus. Now Ares has been provoking fights among mankind for thousands of years, but Diana was molded of clay and Zeus was supposed to have breathed life into her a few short years before the movie began. Diana is an Amazon with superpowers, but the Amazons are mere mortals felled by a single bullet. So first off, there was a conflict between Zeus and Ares, during which Ares was injured and went into hiding. Now Zeus was also injured and used the last of his strength to create the island paradise for the Amazons to live on. Now then, given that Diana ages incredibly slowly, as shown by her appearing the same age over a period of 100 years from the First World War to the modern day, Diana's childhood could have lasted hundreds or even thousands of years. Who knows? You know, Stefan saw a child age into a woman and thought, oh, that probably took about 25 years. Uh, but no, she's a demigod living on a supernatural island. She doesn't age like regular humans. Secondly, Diana isn't an Amazon. And that's what the scene of her discovering her unique powers was supposed to represent. But if you missed that, Stefan, there also was this line of dialogue. As Amazons, this is our duty. But you are not an Amazon like the rest of us. So you will do nothing. And movies must be very confusing indeed if you just ignore half of what happens in them. Um, anyway, let's move on. Now, Chris Pine. Mm. Chris Pine is in fact a charming pile of J. Crew waspy hotness and helps carry the movie with his one-liners that shouldn't be one-liners. Now, as the audience, you become attached to him and then, of course, he has to die so that the population of the world always gets used to male 
disposability. And even the way he dies makes no sense. He's piloting a plane full of poison gas, which he chooses to blow up rather than, say, land safely. Because why? Landing the plane safely would allow the poison gas to be deactivated. Blowing it up in midair will just spread the poison gas for hundreds of miles, causing countless deaths, the prevention of which was the whole point and MacGuffin of the movie to begin with. But you see, men must always be expendable, so plot and logic must be expendable as well. So then, Chris Pine's sacrifice in order to blow up the poison gas plane. Uh, Stefan doesn't understand why the plane can't just be landed safely, uh, but the movie does attempt to explain this. If we can get on the radio, we can ask Flying Court to shoot her down. No, if it crashes, it'll wipe everyone out for 50 square miles. We gotta ground it. Bad news. It's on a timer. If we ground it here, it's the same thing. Stefan also doesn't understand why they have to blow the plane up, uh, but the movie explains this as well. Is it flammable, Chief? Yes, you said it's hydrogen? It's flammable. So the gas is going to be released on a timer and will disperse over a large area, killing everyone around. Um, but it is flammable, so if they explode the plane, the gas will burn up. So Chris Pine flies the plane to a safe distance and then does just that. Is it convoluted movie logic? A little bit, sure, uh, but it does explain itself and it shouldn't be hard to follow. Um, and furthermore, the selfless sacrifice of a man also serves an important narrative purpose that is missed by Stefan, and let's take a look at that. And if you think I'm kidding about male disposability, think of this. Remember the evil woman, Dr. Poison, who concocts the genocidal gas? Remember how Wonder Woman spares her life? She gets to live, the good guy doesn't. So then, Diana spares the life of the evil Dr. Poison, and this proves male disposability, apparently. Um, but I feel like Stefan may have missed the point of this scene, if you couldn't believe such a thing. You see, Ares is using her to say to Diana, look, humans are rubbish, they're evil, they make weapons to kill each other with, let's team up and we'll go and get them. And in response to this, Diana remembers Chris Pine and how nice he was blowing himself up to save everyone, and she says, no, actually, mankind can be good. I believe in them, and I'm not going to join you. You see, the woman's actions are being used as the proof that mankind is evil, and the man's noble sacrifice is being used as the counter-argument that mankind is good. And, of course, Diana spares the life of an unarmed opponent. I mean, what's she gonna do? Just squish her with the tank or something? You know, she's the hero at the climax of the movie. I mean, what were you expecting to happen? <laughs> Actually, I'd kind of like that if Diana just just dropped the tank on her completely unexpectedly. <laughs> That'd be quite good. Now, as usual, almost all the on-screen deaths are male. Female deaths are inevitably deployed as a plot device to heighten the stakes, to raise the tension. Men die anonymously in quick succession. Women die slowly or off-screen. Huh. Using sympathy for women to provoke male aggression does not seem very feminist to me. Ah, well, maybe it is. Hard to tell these days. Now, I'm afraid this is one of those times that Stefan is correct, only if we ignore the times where he's wrong. Uh, for example, the battle at the start of the movie in which many Amazons are killed by German soldiers in quick succession. Um, but if we ignore this bit, though, uh, Stefan makes an excellent point. So, all men are evil or incompetent, except for non-white males, of course, with the exception of one, the Chris Pine character, who must die. Now, all women are wonderful and good, except for one, Dr. Poison, who gets to live. Now, these few sentences are a real masterpiece of appearing to have an argument when in fact you don't really. Um, and let's think about this for a bit. All men are presented as evil or incompetent, except for non-white males, of course, with the exception of one. Chris Pine, who has to die. So, built into Stefan's all men statement, there are two exceptions. All men are presented as evil, only if we first discount the various presentations of men as not evil. And if we do that, wow, point made, you know. Um, however, even with Stefan's caveats there, 
it's not true. Um, for example, all these white soldiers rushing across no man's land are presented pretty heroically, and these liberated villagers seem like they're having a good time, and they don't look evil or incompetent. Um, and there's also Charlie, who's generally a good guy, but I guess he falls under Stefan's classification of incompetent, because he doesn't want to fight anymore due to having PTSD, which, you know, would be a bit cruel and thoughtless, but anyway... Ultimately, the fairly uncomplicated message of the movie is that mankind can be good. Stefan misses this because he's viewing the movie only along the racial and sexual lines that he's imposing. You know, it's not enough that the principal male character is a heroic white man. You know, not all the male characters are heroic white men, and as such, the movie is clearly anti-male, anti-white propaganda. And what is the role of women? in raising such nasty and violent men. Completely absent from the film, of course. Men are just bad. The women who raised them are just saints. For feminists and leftists, environment is everything. You know, you are a criminal because you were raised poor in a poor neighborhood, except for men. Well, they're just bad regardless of environment, regardless of the mothers and female daycare workers and female primary school teachers who raise them, regardless of the welfare state policies that women vote for. Environment creates badness, except for boys raised by women. Then the badness of boys has absolutely nothing to do with women at all. Well, again, the point of the movie is actually not that men are naturally just bad. Uh... But regardless, does Stefan really want the movie to go into how the evil General Ludendorff, say, actually would have been a really nice guy but for the malicious actions of his abusive mother who raised him poorly? Like, what on earth is that? You know, we all remember this classic clip of Stefan I used in another video. All the cold-hearted jerks who run the world came out of the vaginas of women who married assholes. And I don't know how to make the world a better place without holding women accountable for choosing assholes. All the evil men in the world came out of evil women's evil vaginas. Now it appears Stefan has convinced himself pretty well of this convoluted delusion because it seems he's now actually expecting to see it represented in reality. And it's an interesting approach to art criticism, I guess, sir. Uh, Convince yourself of something truly mad, and then when you don't see any evidence of it, that proves the existence of the insidious conspiracy to cover it up. So to any Stefan Molyneux fans watching this video, the reason that the movie doesn't go into the backstories of the violent German soldiers and explore their abuse at the hands of their neglectful mothers who only went out with arseholes and ignored all the nice guys is because it would be really, really weird. Anyway, that's about it for me today. It's kind of a lighter one this time, uh, but the other video I'm working on right now is about police shootings, so I needed the levity, to be honest. And I certainly had fun watching Stefan try to cram his ideology into the movie however he could. Um, I might come back to this again and check out the many, many other movies that Stefan tells us the truth about. I hope you could hear the air quotes there. Um, let me know what you think about that idea in the comments. Also consider supporting me on Patreon, if you like, uh, like all these lovely people right here. Uh, I don't run ads on my videos, and I'd like to keep it that way. Uh, also, follow me on Twitter, or send me a Curious Cat question, if you like. I really like questions. Um, okay, folks, I'll see you next time. I actually, <laughs> I actually waved goodbye at my microphone then. See ya.